So Juan, whenever you're ready to start. I, I okay, think. yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2021 uh, Lee Page Lectures in Physics. Um, so the Lee Page Lectures have been around since 1967. Um, they're named in honor of uh, Lee Page, who was a faculty member in theoretical physics at Yale in the early 20th century. And my understanding is that he worked on uh, the space-time symmetries of Maxwell's equations, including their uh, conformal invariance, um, which is sort of appropriate um, given uh, today's speaker, uh, who I'm honored to introduce, Professor uh, Juan Maldacena from the um, Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, uh, where he is the Carl Feinberg professor, or has been since 2016. Uh, professor Maldacena um, obtained his PhD also from Princeton in 1996, um, working on the topics of black holes in string theory. Um, he has been on the faculty at Harvard um, from 1997 until 2001, and then has been at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, since then, since 2001, until currently, where he is the Feinberg professor. Uh, professor Maldacena has made fundamental contributions to theoretical physics in particular to quantum gravity and string theory, uh, to quantum field theory, and also to cosmology. And uh, he's perhaps most known um, for something that when I was a graduate student in the late 1990s was known as the Maldacena conjecture. Although by now, I guess the evidence is so overwhelming and robust for this idea. Um, that we just call it ADS-CFT, uh, which doesn't really do justice to um, what it is, which is an unexpected equivalence relation between systems, ordinary quantum mechanical systems, similar to the ones that we study in the lab every day, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, theories of quantum gravity in higher dimensions. Uh, Professor Maldacena has won numerous awards for uh, his research. Um, I think it would take up the entire hour to list all of them, so I'll just name some highlights, which include the MacArthur uh, Foundation grant in 1999, the so-called Genius Grant. In 2007, the Heinemann Prize in Mathematical Physics from the American Physical Society in 2008, the Dirac Medal from the ICTP in Trieste, and in 2012, the Milner Prize from the Milner Foundation. Um, the Professor Malacina has been involved in recent developments or recent progress in understanding the information content of quantum mechanical black holes, um, and that is the subject of the talk today, which is titled Black Holes and the Structure of Space-Time. And so without further ado, um, I'll leave the floor to Professor Maldacena. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. So this talk, uh, we'll be talking about black holes. Um, black holes are very uh, confusing objects uh, in general relativity. Um, they were found by Schwarzschild. Um, Einstein then thought that they were not really um, they were mathematical curiosities, but they were not really realizable in physics. And then other, other researchers uh, realized uh, that they are really unavoidable consequences of general relativity. Um, and then there were surprises. Uh, when you consider quantum mechanics, uh, they are not even black. So even the name was wrongly chosen for black holes. And um, then Hawking said that maybe they are incompatible with quantum mechanics. And trying to answer this question led to many uh, interesting progress. Uh, and in string, from the string theory point of view, uh, black holes are seen from the outside, we think are compatible with quantum mechanics. And they also 
Uh, we also see a certain relationship between quantum mechanics and space-time geometries. But there are many, many, many passes with interior. So this has been a short outline of what I plan to discuss during this talk. Um, it will be a general talk uh, introducing properties of black holes, uh, their confusing aspects, and the things we have learned about black holes. Uh, we start with, this is supposed to be a public talk, so we'll start with something basic, which is the principle of relativity, enunciated, which is usually ascribed to Galileo, which says that an observer traveling with constant velocity observes, observes the same laws of physics as what as an observer at rest. So if they are each in their own laboratories, they their experiments look indistinguishable. Now, the principle of relativity of Einstein is basically the same thing, except that there is one new law of physics, which says that there is a maximum velocity for signal propagation, the speed of light. Um, and this has uh, a surprising consequence. It says that these two observers, one traveling relative to the other, should see the same velocity for this, uh, this light wave or electromagnetic wave. Um, and this looks counterintuitive, uh, but it is possible because time flows differently for each observer. So time flows at a different speed for each observer. And that was the new insight that uh, Einstein had. So in that way, both could uh, measure the same speed. I mean, if, if instead of a speed, if instead of light, we had, let's say, sound wave, of course, our intuition would say that this guy uh, would measure a lower speed. But in the case of light, uh, they both measure the same speed. Um, now, this uh, leads to the so-called twin paradox. So imagine we get uh, two twins that are born uh, at the same time, and one travels very fast and then returns to the original location. Uh, and then uh, the one that was traveling would age less than the one who was staying in place. Um, now, this paradox is sometimes a little, uh, or it's called paradox, but this is what's supposed to happen. And for elementary particles, one can check that this is indeed what happens. Or if we take a very precise clock and you do this experiment, you also see this effect. But what is the difference between these two twins? Uh, the difference is that this twin here felt some acceleration. So uh, the two twins are not completely symmetric. So the twin on the right uh, felt some acceleration. And now let's imagine that there was a rule. Uh, let's imagine the following uh, thought experiment or question. Suppose that uh, there is a rule that says that the twins are born, and then when they meet again, they both die. Now, which twin, twin would you rather be? Would you rather be the twin that was moving with constant velocity, namely, let's say, zero, or the one that um, was moving with change in velocity that felt some acceleration when he was? Uh, slowing down and then accelerating back. back. Um, I guess you probably all uh, would choose uh, to be the one uh, that was staying with constant velocity. And in fact, uh, elementary particles also prefer this. So if you take two particles and you produce them and you say that they have to reach a certain space-time location at some point late, later in time, um, the, the particles will try to move along straight lines or moving with constant velocity in such a way that they maximize the time that they live. So this is uh, the principle of maximal life or maximal experience time. And it's, uh, a, it's what particles do in space time. Um, so the lesson uh, out of, so the reason I was mentioning these few things, uh, I was reviewing uh, these concepts of special relativity and, and the way I was reviewing them just to remind you of this connection between space and time that form a single entity space time and that time depends uh, how we measure time depends on how we are moving and once we're given a certain uh, space time particles move in straight lines um, so in lines with constant velocity to maximize their lifetime so Mars particles try to always maximize their lifetime now, so that was space time. Now we'll discuss something apparently different, which is gravity. Of course, our intuition is that uh, heavier objects fall faster, um, but Galileo re realized that everything falls in the same way once we remove the effects of air resistance. And Einstein uh, was thinking about this and had what he called the happy thought, which was the idea that when you fall freely, 
uh, gravity disappears. Um, so because if everything falls in the same way, if you are, if you were standing, um, let's say in an elevator, uh, standing on a scale, for example, and you are falling together with the elevator and the scale and everything, so everything would be falling exactly in the same way, and the scale would uh, see zero weight. Um, so gravity would disappear. Um, and this uh, he promoted to a new principle of physics, a new physical law, which sometimes is called the equivalence principle, uh, which says that it is possible when you're in a gravitational field uh, to be falling, freely falling in such a way that gravity sort of locally disappears. Um, so that's why, for example, astronauts uh, feel weightless. They are moving and going around the Earth exactly in the same way as the spaceship. Um, and out of these principles uh, and a few other ideas, Einstein formulated the theory of general relativity, which says that the gravity is due to the geometry of space-time. So space-time is not flat with a fixed geometry, but space-time can be curved, can have um, can be deformed, and a heavy object will curve and deform the space-time around it. And then the a particle that is moving in that space-time will follow this maximum lifetime trajectory in that space-time. So the trajectory, which so the reason the particle, let's say, gets attracted to the Earth and so on is because it's locally trying to maximize its own lifetime. Um, now, something important is that, uh, so we normally think of gravity as deforming space, and in most of the pictures uh, of space-time, space, space time, uh, it looks as if space is the thing that is deformed. But it's important for our story that uh, gravity deforms the flow of time. Um, and so let's uh, review how this happens. Um, well, not how this happens, but what happens. So we'll, we'll see what happens. If you have two observers in the gravitational field of the Earth, let's say one in the lower floor of the building and one in the upper floor of the building. Uh, then, um, and each one has a clock. Uh, they find that the clock that is in the upper, uh, in the upper stories uh, runs faster than the clock uh, down in the bottom floor. Of course, here I greatly exaggerated the effect. So the effect is about a part in 10 to the 15. So it's a very, very tiny effect. But it's an effect that with the best uh, atomic clocks that people can make nowadays, in principle, well, this effect can be measured. And these clocks are sensitive to a height difference of a few centimeters. Um, so now we have another version of the twins paradox. Um, the, we could have the two twins, and let's say one gets uh, near a massive body for a while, and then um, this one uh, will be a little younger than the one who stayed far away. Um, now, using the equations, so Einstein gave some equations which uh, relate the curvature of space-time to the density of matter. Um, they are somewhat complicated equations, but uh, Schwarzschild, just uh, about a year later, and while he was uh, fighting a war, he found the, the solutions to these equations. And the solutions to the, to the equations tell us the full geometry of the full space-time around a massive star, star. It only tells us the solution outside the massive star. And it, it tells us many things. It tells us the geometry of space, of time, of the full space-time. But in particular, we are going to focus on one particular aspect of the geometry which is how time flows uh, for observers who are at different radial distances from the star. Remember that when we talked about the gravitational field of the Earth, um, a clock would flow at different velocities, or time would flow at different velocities at in various floors. So we can have uh, the whole graph of how that happens outside the star. So there is some flow of time here far away represented by this clock. And then uh, if we have an observer who's a little closer uh, to the surface, who's close to the surface of the star, the clock will uh, move a little bit more slowly. For the case of the sun, that's a factor of one in, in 10 to the, to the seven. So it's a very it's a small, uh, some small effect, but uh, it would go more slowly. And the person uh, standing here 
at some fixed uh, radial distance will feel some weight, okay? As we feel here in the Earth. So we are locally accelerating and we are feeling some weight. Now, if we took this exactly the same star and we made it smaller, so the we have a star with the same mass but a smaller size, uh, then we would find that this effect, so at the surface of the star, the time runs even more slowly and the person uh, sitting there feels an even larger weight. Now, what Schwarzschild found was that if the star was smaller than a certain amount, um, which we now call the black hole radius or sometimes the Schwarzschild radius, something very peculiar happens. It would look like someone who's sitting here would feel time not moving at all. So time is slowed down completely, it's, it's, uh, stop flowing. And not only that, but such a person would feel an infinite weight. So the someone who's just sitting here, uh, the constant radial position would feel an infinite weight. And this is this was very surprising. And this is Einstein expect, expected that this uh, could not really happen in a real physical star. And thought for that reason, he thought that this solution uh, wasn't physical. Um, but something important about this, uh, this observers, this observer that is feeling an infinite weight and who's feeling that time has stopped, is that they are not freely falling. Okay? What would happen if they were freely falling observers? Um, it turns out that the geometry actually continues behind the horizon, and that was understood later. Um, and when you continue the geometry behind the horizon, there is a region behind, um, or maybe should be said to the future, uh, that looks like basically collapsing universe. There's a region where space-time undergoes a collapse, and it's like a big crunch, and the whole region, that whole region collapses into what we call a singularity. So some region where the space-time curvature becomes infinite. Something important is that when we're crossing the horizon, nothing special happens. We don't feel anything special at that point. So it looks like any other point in space-time. Uh, we do feel something very bad when we get to the singularity because the tidal gravitational forces become infinite and they would tear us apart. So it's not a good idea to enter a black hole. Um, and once, however, once we cross the horizon, it's unavoidable that we will fall into the singularity. We cannot escape back, back out. Um, and one comment is that sometimes uh, it is said that the singularity is inside, but it, it, well, we could say it's inside, but it's really into the future. The singularity is not the point in space, but the point in time. It's um, it's a collapse. It's the, the opposite of a big bang. It's a big crunch where the the singularity is in our future, if we fall into the black hole. Now, in order to understand a little bit more intuitively this, this, these features, Unru proposed the following analogy. So imagine that uh, you have a river uh, where there is water flowing, and then at some point there is a water flow, a waterfall. And the speed at which the river flows increases uh, slowly as it approaches the waterfall. And then in this river, there are some fish that can swim with some velocity that we will call seas. This is analogous to the velocity of light. And the fish are analogous to, to light uh, itself, to particles of light. Um, and then in the regions where the velocity of the water is less than the velocity, uh, that this maximum velocity the fish can swim, um, the fish can swim upstream and can avoid falling into the waterfall. However, if we uh, have a fish that sits exactly at the horizon, then that uh, that fish might, might swim to the right. So, sorry, the horizon is the place, it's analogous to the place where the velocity of the water is actually equal to the velocity at which the fish can swim. And then such a fish will stay at that location, never being able to, uh, to escape. And uh, a fish that uh, is uh, in this region where the velocity of the water is bigger than that, the velocity they can swim at, they falls into the singularity, which in this case is well, the, the waterfall. So however, if the fish live in, uh, live in this river, 
and the water, let's say it's muddy and they cannot see the banks of the river, then they have no way of telling, of realizing that they've crossed the horizon. So they, this horizon place looks the same as any other uh, point in the river. Um, they only feel something bad when they fall into the, sink, into the waterfall. Now, of course, these aspects of black holes were studied over many years, and some of the lessons that have been learned are that, well, first of all, once you cross the horizon, you cannot get out. Um, it was also realized that a star can collapse into a black hole. Um, and furthermore, that there are objects in the sky that seem to be black holes. Now, real black holes are coming uh, roughly two types. One is the, the one, ones are produced by the collapse of very massive stars that have a size in this range. And then uh, and masses of uh, a few tenths of the mass of the sun. And black holes um, at the center of galaxies, which are much uh, heavier and they are much bigger. They have a size of the solar system and masses of a million to a billion sun solar masses. Now, how do we see them and why do we think they're there? Um, there are uh, two main ways. So one is that matter falls in, it heats up and it emits light or other, other radiation. And the other uh, way is that we see the gravity waves produced when uh, two black holes collide. So um, gravity waves are probably one of the most spectacular signatures of black holes. Uh, they were only detected a few years ago, and this, of course, uh, made a big splash. And now there are many black hole collisions that have been detected in this way. Um, so here we have two black holes that are orbiting each other, and they emit uh, gravitational radiation, they lose energy, and they slowly approach each other until they completely collide and uh, emit a big pulse of gravitational radiation, which uh, can be detected here on Earth through some very sophisticated gravity wave detectors. Now, there are also the black holes at the center of galaxies, and these um, galaxies have, some galaxies have uh, some big sheds uh, coming out of their centers. They were, when these were found, they, um, the hypothesis that they were black holes was one of the hypotheses many years ago in the 60s. And most recently, uh, for this particular galaxy, M87, so these are just some pictures, Hubble Space Telescope pictures, I think. Um, so we had this uh, beautiful picture from the Event Horizon Telescope. This is a radio telescope that made uh, this picture of the matter that is near uh, the center, but it's uh, moving around the black hole. So the black hole is roughly this size, a, little, a bit slow. Yeah. Um, now, many galaxies similar to ours have black holes, these black holes at the center. And there is uh, recently, um, well, through, through the last many years, there was evidence of stars um, moving around uh, relatively fast around the black hole that is at the center of the Milky Way. And Gitz and Gensel uh, got the Nobel Prize um, for, for the study of these stars. So in summary, we are really in a golden era for black hole observations. And it's uh, really remarkable how many different ways in which we can see black holes uh, are emerging. Now, however, in this talk, I will uh, talk about some theoretical aspects of black holes. So for the rest of the talk, we'll focus on uh, theoretical aspects of black holes. Um, and first, we'll start with some interesting uh, mentioning some interesting classical aspects of black holes. So the first property is the, their universality. So the final shape of a black hole is independent of how it is formed. It is only characterized by its mass, its angular momentum, or angular rotation velocity, and its charge. Um, so stars can have very different shapes and colors and chemical compositions. But if they collapse into a black hole, the final black hole um, is very universal. It is independent of the matter that uh, formed the black hole. So if you were to form a black hole with dark matter, then uh, it will be the same, uh, the same shape. Um, so let me just make a comment. 
So the ancients uh, thought that heavenly bodies were perfect spheres. So like uh, the surface, the, the moon was a perfect sphere and they would all move in perfect spheres and so on. Now we now know planets are stars are not perfect spheres, but if you had a non-rotating black hole, it is supposed to be a perfect sphere. Okay, so we our modern science also has uh, some perfect spheres. At least Einstein's uh, theory of uh, general relativity has these astronomical bodies, which are supposed to be perfect spheres. And well, they are also rotating, so the ones rotating are not uh, spherical, but they have a shape which can be theoretically computed. And so uh, that's a remarkable fact. Now, another remarkable uh, property of black holes is the so-called area law. And this is, uh, imagine the following uh, situation. So let's return to our black hole collision. So we have two black holes that collide and form another black hole and they emit gravity waves. Now in this process, uh, some energy is emitted uh, into gravity waves and the mass of the final black hole is smaller than the sum of the masses of the two initial black holes. Um, uh, however, the mass of the black hole, this black hole cannot be very small because there is this area law, which was found by Hawking, which says that um, the area of the horizon always increases. So the final area should be the sum of the areas of the horizon of these uh, two initial black holes. Um, the area is uh, sort of quadratic in the mass, so that's why the mass can decrease, but the area, the total mass can decrease, but the total area can be bigger. So it is a remarkable, simple, in a remarkably simple inequality that follows from the complicated equations of general relativity. And you can argue for this inequality without solving all the equations, just um, from the property that uh, black hole horizons are moving along light-like surfaces and the idea that uh, gravity is uh, an attractive force. Um, so, so far we, we discussed uh, black holes according to Einstein theory of general relativity, which is a classical theory. When we include quantum mechanics, we find a new surprise. Um, so we find that there could be black, white black holes. Uh, more precisely, uh, Hawking famously discovered that the laws of quantum mechanics imply that black holes emit thermal radiation. Now, he found how the temperature of this radiation depends on the size of the black hole. And it is such that the size increases, the, sorry, the temperature increases as the size decreases. So as uh, we have a smaller and smaller black hole, the black hole uh, is hotter and hotter. So it goes from being somewhat black to being red and white. Now here are the temperatures for black holes of various masses. So I won't give you the formula, but I will just give you a few examples. So for a case of a black hole of the mass of the sun, um, this temperature is very, very, very small. So this is 0 0.00 many zeros. Uh, degrees Kelvin. So Kelvin is uh, the degrees measure from the absolute zero. So this temperature is so, so small that it's completely uh, undetectable for astrophysical black holes, um, which as we said, uh, had masses bigger than the mass of the sun. So these are the black holes that are known to be produced by nature. On the other hand, uh, if we had a black hole which uh, had the size of a bacterium, uh, such a black hole would ma have a mass of roughly a continent, um, like the whole North American, North or South American continent. Um, that um, that black hole would have a temperature which is about 7,000 Kelvin or, or so, so a few thousand Kelvin, um, a few thousand degrees Celsius, which um, is such that, well, comparable to the temperatures at the surface of the sun and so on, so such a black hole will look white, okay? Uh, so it would really look white to our eyes. It would emit very, not very much uh, radiation, but it would look white. So I emphasize this because it shows uh, that even, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, the name black hole was uh, wrongly chosen. So once you, um, once you include these effects of Hawking radiation, you can change the color of a black hole. Now. I would like to discuss some experimental evidence for the existence of this Hawking radiation. And 
as we saw, this effect is negligible for astrophysical black holes. So there is actually no experimental evidence of this radiation from the black hole point of view. However, uh, there is a similar effect in cosmology. So when we have a, a universe that is expanding very fast, uh, there is also a temperature in such a universe. And such a fast, fast expanding universe arises in the theory of inflation. So that's a theory about the very early universe, which postulates that the universe had a period of fast expansion at the very beginning. And in fact, uh, this temperature is the, our current best explanation via well, this theory of inflation that we mentioned for the origin of the primordial fluctuation. So these primordial fluctuations are the density fluctuations um, that uh, take the universe from being uniform to being slightly non-uniform. And those slight uh, inhomogeneities then grew to form galaxies and so on. So um, the effects that give rise to these primordial fluctuations are intimately related to the effects of Hawking, the Hawking radiation. Um, so in, in this very indirect way, we could say that we not only have experimental evidence, but the existence of our existence is uh, dependent on such, uh, such fluctuations. So they form an integral uh, part of our uh, description of cosmology and description of nature. Now, so, so far I've said what Hawking radiation is, and now we'll discuss a little bit why it happens. Um, and so I will give just a sort of cartoon explanation that uh, with the basic ideas of why it happens. And so it, 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 uh, the, the derivation of Hawking radiation that uh, Hawking made is based on relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, this is a theory uh, that puts together the principles of quantum mechanics and of special relativity. In this theory, uh, particles can be created and destroyed. These are the types of theories we use to describe particle physics, uh, the collisions at the LHC or any other particle accelerator, the interactions of light and matter and so on. Now in these theories, the, the vacuum is a somewhat complicated place where um, particles in principle are all the time being created and destroyed in pairs, one with positive energy and one with negative energy. However, energy should be conserved and also, there is a certain law that says that only positive energy particles can uh, exist. Um, and um, however, the policemen that uh, enforce that law are subject to the uncertainty principle. So if a negative energy particle exists, but exists for only a very short time, this policeman allows allow them to exist. So at short, short times, you can have these fluctuations. This is one way to understand the possibility of these vacuum fluctuations. Um, and, but in flat space, these negative energy particles should very soon find a positive energy particle. Otherwise, the policeman will discover, uh, will discover it. And so in flat space, there is no net particle creation. But in the presence of a horizon, there is a new uh, feature that happens. What happens is that there is a big distortion of the notion of time. Um, and that implies also a big distortion in what we mean by energy. And so what looks like uh, a pair, so from the point of view of the policeman outside, um, what looks like uh, some energy, negative energy in the inside, to the point of, from the point of view of the policeman inside, looks like a particle with negative, let's say, momentum. And, and that um, they can exist with these particles inside can exist with positive or negative momentum. So this policeman inside is pretty, pretty happy with this particle and lets it exist and, and so on. However, the positive energy particle can, um, therefore the positive energy particle now is free to escape to go to infinity. And we have this constant stream of uh, particles going all the way to infinity um, that are carrying out positive energy and there are, there's also a constant stream of particles going into the interior, uh, depositing ne negative energy and therefore uh, lowering the mass of the black hole. Um, so this effect of Hawking radiation implies that a black hole uh, loses mass and it has a finite lifetime. Um, and here are the lifetimes of various black holes. So mass of a, a black hole of the mass of the sun, like the astrophysical type black holes, will live much longer than the age of the universe. A black hole with an ordinary mass, so if we could put, uh, let's say, 100 kilograms 
into a black hole. That would, that's very difficult technically to do that, uh, very, very, very extremely difficult. But if one could do that, it would evaporate in a very tiny fraction of a second, and it would be worse than a nuclear bomb. Uh, and another landmark is a black hole of a mass of about a mountain that was produced at the beginning of the Big Bang. Um, and such black holes, if they were produced, uh, they would be evaporating now. But no such black holes were detected. And there are scenarios that produce uh, black holes at the beginning of the universe. In fact, there are even theories that say that some of the black holes that LIGO detects uh, might be black holes that were produced at the beginning of the universe. But um, so there are, th it's theoretically possible to produce the black holes at the beginning of the universe, but there is no conclusive evidence that there was any uh, primordial black hole being detected. In addition, they, there could be very tiny little black holes producing particle accelerators. Such black holes would decay very quickly. And again, uh, no such black holes were detected in, in any particle accelerator. Um, now, these effects of the temperature, of the black hole temperature, are very interesting because they lead to interesting theoretical problems. And I would, I would like to spend some time explaining uh, what these puzzles and what these problems are. The first is uh, why are black holes hot? And the second uh, is the problem of information loss. So we'll, we'll see these problems in turn. So first, uh, talk, let's talk about temperature. So temperature, since the times of Boltzmann, so since uh, many, lots long time ago, we understand temperature as due to the motion of the microscopic constituents of matter. So if we have a gas, the gas is made out of little molecules that are all moving around. And the only, the only difference between cold and hot gas is that the molecules in the cold gas are moving more slowly than the ones in the hot gas. So heat is due to the microscopic uh, constituents of matter. And the question is, what is moving in the case of a black hole? So what are the constituents of a black hole um, that are moving? Um, now, the loss of thermodynamics uh, allow us to have an estimate uh, or calculate the number of configurations of these constituents. And that's uh, through the concept of entropy. So you can view the first law of thermodynamics as giving us this number uh, if we know the energy and the temperature. And we can calculate this number. And it turns out to be proportional to the, well, equal to the area um, in uh, Planck units. So. The, this length, this unit of length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, is the length scale at which quantum gravity effects would become import, important. This is a very tiny length scale. So this entropy is actually very, very large for a macroscopic black hole. In fact, if you calculate the entropy of uh, the whole universe, the whole gas of the universe, and so on, uh, and also the black holes in the universe, the entropy is uh, dominated by the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Um, now, this uh, identification of the entropy with the area um, leads to a new interpretation of the area law uh, that was found by Hawking. So it now can be interpreted as a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. So there is this interesting connection between the loss of dynamics of general relativity, which is a completely classical and deterministic theory, to uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which uh, is a thermodynamic uh, idea that is based on statistical physics. So the question, this first question is understanding what these constituents of the black hole are. Oh, there was some problem with this picture. The molecules are going outside the box. But anyway. Um, so the question is, um, what are these microscopic constituents of space-time, and what we think that they should be related to the structure and nature of space-time? Now, for the for the error, so we know the error appears to be uniform, but at molecular scale, its molecular scales is not uniform. It consists of random, randomly moving molecules. And the same thing for black holes. Classically, they were these perfect spheres, but quantum mechanically we conclude that they should not be totally uniform. There should be something fluctuating. It's related to what give ri gives rise to Hawking radiation. And we would like to understand what these atoms of space-time are, so these moving things uh, in space-time. 
So that's one question. I like to focus first on the questions uh, rather than specific answers. And we'll now uh, discuss another question, which is the problem of information loss. Uh, so we can form a black hole in different ways, but it will always evaporate in the same way, in the sense that uh, we saw that black holes had a universal form, uh, independent of the matter that made them. And the Hawking radiation, as computed by Hawking, also has a universal form independent of the matter that made them, made, made the black holes. However, if uh, black holes are supposed to be, behave as quantum mechanical objects, these thermal aspects should arise as an approximation. There should be subtle differences in the outgoing radiation, which carry the information of how the black hole was made. Um, so in order to address some of these problems, we need to we need a theory that puts together quantum, mechanic and quantum mechanics and gravity. And such a theory is the so-called string theory. Now, I won't discuss uh, much details of string theory. So I just mentioned that it's a theory under construction. It's a theory of quantum gravity. So it's a theory about the quantum mechanics of space-time. And it reduces to Einstein's theory under ordinary circumstances. That is to say, at low energies or long distances. And and it has many other properties that I won't discuss, but something that I will discuss is that it can describe in a complete way certain simple universes with negative curvature. And this is the so-called holography or ADS-CFT. Um, it's a conjecture, but there is a lot of evidence uh, for this conjecture. And so it's normally assumed that it is true. And there is the idea that we can describe the interior of certain space times in, term, in, term, in terms of a theory at their boundary. So the space times are typically negatively cursed space times. And so here they are represented by uh, this picture, which is a picture of a two dimensional negatively cursed space. Uh, here, all the fish have the same proper size and the fish seem to accumulate here at the boundaries uh, they seem to accumulate as we go near these boundaries because of the projection we have done from the negatively curved space to uh, the flat screen. So this is similar to the distortion that arises when you have a map of the world and you make the usual um, flat space projection and then the Antarctica, get, Antarctica gets uh, blown up to be very big. So the opposite happens in, 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 in negatively curved spaces where um, the regions far away are shrunk to uh, are shrunk in this way, and so um, so the idea is that we can describe the physics in two ways. We can have um, gravitational physics that takes place in the interior of the space times, or we can have a theory of ordinary quantum particles without gravity, uh, which is living on the boundary of the space times. So this is another representation of the same idea. So we have some object, let's say, moving in the interior. And uh, this object, we can describe it using the laws of uh, you know, gravity in the interior. Or um, we can describe it alternatively in a theory of strongly interacting particles in the boundary, which interacts through uh, interactions similar to the, inter the strong interactions of nature, um, but without gravity. And so this uh, funny uh, back and forth motion is supposed to be representing the fact that the particles are strongly interacting with each other. Now, in the same way that we can describe um, a particle, we could also uh, describe a black hole. So we had a black hole. We would also describe it in terms of a fluid of particles, so a large number of particles uh, that is uh, moving here on the boundary. And this fluid has a large number of particles. And to first approximation, it should be very uniform. Uh, this is not quite represented here because I ran out of patience making uh, this moving little particles. Um, but that's uh, basically how it should look like. And then uh, the temperature and entropy of the black hole are uh, calculated, uh, they, they are equal to the temperature and uh, entropy of the boundary particles. Or if you wish, the answer to that question of what the atoms of space are. Uh, well, the atoms of space are these particles that live on the boundary. So it's a funny description where in order to discuss um, to, to discuss very precisely this uh, fundamental constituents of space-time, you get an answer where the 
fundamental constituents of space-time live on the boundary of the space-time, not, not in the interior. Uh, now, the advantage is that uh, the theorem on the boundary obeys the rules of quantum mechanics, and therefore the same uh, happens for the black hole in the interior. And so black holes are consistent with quantum mechanics. If you accept, the, there's a fine print here, which says that if you accept that uh, holographic conjecture, uh, of course, that we would like to understand completely where this conjecture is really exactly true or not. Uh, now, in, in this, in this, this in holography, the there is a, an immersion geometry. So we have a quantum system that lives purely at the boundary. Those uh, strongly interacting particles living at the boundary. Here, the yellow line, and they give rise to uh, an extra dimension. So uh, some extra dimensions of space time. And the question is how this happens. So I, I will discuss in an, with an analogy how this happens. Um, and I we will call it a verbal analogy. So we'll start with something simple. So let's say we have a sentence. Uh, here I chose some random sentence. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. So this is a sentence. And so that's the sentence again. And now when you heard this sentence, you analyze the various words. So you did some analysis, which, well, you did this subconsciously, but you analyze, you identified all the words. And not only that, but you identified the various subphrases. Um, and you identify the two main uh, clauses of the sentence and so on. Um, you understood its meaning. And you also notice that the sentence has uh, long distance correlations between certain words. So for example, the word man, his, and he uh, are correlated. So if it was a woman, we would have to change all these three words. Um, and the notion of keeping pace and drummer are also correlated. So there are some with some short distance correlations that determine words, and then longer distance correlations that determine the more deeper meaning of the sentence. And as we go um, down in this analysis, we identify a deeper and deeper meaning of a sentence. Okay. So the extra dimension has to be is related to the correlations present in this sentence. So that's uh, roughly the analogy that here, um, the quantum, the state of the quantum system is related to a very long and complicated sentence, and the bulk space-time characterizes the correlations uh, in this sentence. And then sometimes there are pieces of the sentence that have very long distance correlations, and those are related to particles that propagate in this bulk um, space-time. Um, now we can ask, well, what is a black hole in this space-time? Well, let's go back to the sentence. So this is the same as the sentence we saw before. Um, and uh, now we'll um, now we'll just uh, simply change some of the words. So here uh, we change some of the words, and we lost some of the correlations. So for example, uh, now it says man here and says uh, she here. So we lost uh, that correlation that we had before. Um, so we changed this word here. So we also lost that other correlation. And so the sentence makes sense up to a certain level, but it lost some of its deeper meaning. Okay. So we lost uh, these longer distance correlations. So we say that there is a horizon of meaning. So we cannot go, uh, we cannot find the meaning of the sentence beyond this depth. Um, now, if we were to make uh, more changes to the sentence, um, so then the sentence might make sense uh, more locally, but uh, again, uh, it um, loses meaning at certain depth, which is uh, higher than the previous the one we had before, so it loses uh, meaning earlier. So we can say that the black hole grows, the ignorance uh, uh, grows also. Uh, and then we could go to the final situation where we change all the words randomly, and uh, we have uh, the black hole has grown, to, has grown to its maximal size. And the area of the black hole uh, is uh, the area is related to the ignorance we have about uh, the sentence, and this um, this area growth. Uh, the idea that the area should grow typically grows is that random changes are more likely to mess up a sentence is if we edit it randomly. So if we 
start editing a sentence at random and changing the words at random, it's likely to lose its meaning. And it's like, so we'll create a black hole and the more we change it, the bigger uh, the, the size of the black hole. Now imagine that the changes were produced by a reversible process, let's say like an encryption algorithm, where it's completely deterministic. Each letter goes to some other letter in a completely deterministic way. Um, then what we could do is we could reverse the process and recover the original sentence. Um, and now the laws of physics on the boundary are uh, change the state of the, the change the state of the boundary theory. And the laws of physics are analogous to an encryption process in the sense that they are reversible. Um, and therefore, um, using that those laws of physics at the boundary, we can undo the formation of the black hole and in, princi in principle, recover the original information. Now, I would like to uh, finish this talk with a somewhat more philosophical comment about uh, the methodology of uh, exploring these theoretical issues of black holes. Um, and this, is, this has to do with the role of thought experiments. So thought experiments were important in developing the theory of general relativity. And I will discuss one example. So uh, this is a famous example of the falling elevator. Uh, so Einstein uh, considered the person who was in an elevator, which starts at rest, let's say, and starts falling down. Um, it accelerates moving down. So this is the height and this is time. So these are three snapshots at different times uh, of the elevator falling down. Now, from the point of view of the interior person, uh, there is no gravity. So the, he's, uh, he or she is floating inside this elevator. Now, let's say that this person who's floating in the elevator sends a pulse of light from the left side of the elevator to the right side of the elevator. Okay, So the light, uh, this person would expect the light to just follow a straight line from the left to the right, because there is no force of gravity. And so that's the inside perspective. And here are three snapshots. So the light comes out, it uh, crosses the body, and then goes to the other side. Uh, now we'll see the same thing from the outside point of view. So the person is falling down and the light uh, starts here. It um, crosses here the middle and then it hits the other side at this place down. And so from the point of view of the outside observer, light is falling down, okay? So the outside observer concludes that uh, gravity uh, makes light uh, fall down. Okay. And of course, this led to the prediction of uh, the deflection of light by the sun and so on. That was one of the earliest uh, confirmations of general relativity. Now, in this discussion of black holes, there is an underlying uh, thought experiment that uh, people usually discuss, and it's the following. So there are two perspectives for an observer falling into a black hole, and much of the work on these theoretical aspects of black holes is to understand the relationship between these two perspectives. So there is the freely fall, let's say we have a freely falling observer. From the point of view of the observer freely falling, nothing happens. They just cross the horizon and they're perfectly happy. On the other hand, from the outside perspective, um, there is something very different that happens. So here we're going to uh, look at the static observer and include, we are going to include the facts of Hawking radiation. So we, we mentioned the same plot uh, when we were talking about, um, about the flow of time. So now we we'll imagine an observer who's sitting at some distance from the black hole, they feel uh, some temperature. Then uh, they will feel a bigger temperature as they are closer to the black hole horizon. And as they get closer and closer, they feel a larger and larger temperature. And an observer who will be sitting here at the black hole horizon would feel an actually an infinite temperature. Okay, That's related to the fact that they felt an infinite weight uh, before. Um, so from the outside observer, someone who falls in gets burned by Hawking radiation at the horizon. Okay, So it's a completely uh, different uh, description. And, uh, and so we have, again, two different perspectives. And trying to reconcile them, at least theoretically, leads to some of the ideas that I mentioned before, like uh, such as holography. Um, and then there are some ideas that we didn't mention here, such as ideas of quantum entanglement. And those also played an important role. 
and we'll discuss them probably in future lectures. Now, for the case of falling light, Einstein did not get the right value for the deflection angle from his initial thought experiment alone. He really came up uh, with the right value by thinking about the complete theory of general relativity. And for quantum gravity, we don't yet have a full theory of quantum gravity that is valid for any process. I mean, string theory gives us some, some very nice results, but uh, there are things we cannot describe in string theory, such as the beginning of the universe. Um, and, but we think that the lessons we are learning are useful steps for developing this theory. And there are deep connections between areas of physics that are shown by this type of thought experiments. And we hope that once we find the right theory, uh, there will be predictions that are more easily checked than the black hole uh, predict dis discussion we had. Of course, the idea that black hole formation and evaporation is a unitary process is certainly a falsifiable prediction, but it's very difficult to falsify because it's very difficult to make a small black hole. Um, so hopefully there will be some other prediction, perhaps through cosmology, that will be easier to, to, to check and to verify. Now, in the, during the next two lectures, we'll uh, discuss the following two topics. So the, the next lecture uh, will be on wormholes and entanglement. And we, start, uh, we will start with the science fiction question of uh, whether uh, science fiction wormholes uh, exist or not. And we'll try to convince you that, that they don't exist. And then we'll discuss some type of traversable wormholes that could exist. And we'll explain the connection of those uh, with entanglement. And then the, the third lecture will be on the entropy of Hawking radiation. Uh, this, um, so Hawking found that the entropy of radiation, of Hawking radiation is larger than that of the matter that made the black hole. And uh, we'll, we'll compute it using a recently development, developed a gravitational entropy formula and find a different answer, which is actually consistent with quantum mechanics. So that those will be the topics of the next two lectures. So in conclusions, um, black holes are fascinating objects where the geometry of space-time is deformed in a dramatic way. Black holes and quantum mechanics give rise to interesting theoretical challenges. And string theory and holography can describe black holes in a consistent way, at least from the outside. And space-time in this picture is an effective or approximate concept, which arises from these more elementary particles living on the boundary of space-time. And entanglement or correlations play a crucial role in determining the structure of space time. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Juan, for that uh, very clear talk. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. So I ask to try to keep it orderly. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll look for you. Um, so let's see. Uh, John Harris, that's a question. You there, John? You are muted. We can't hear you. Seems to be on mute. John, are you there? Well, if not, we'll go to Moshe. I think he's he also has a question. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question that I asked many of my colleagues still searching for a reasonable answer. So I teach mechanics and I teach about the escape velocity of object from gravity. V square is equal to 2 GME over R. Yeah. I, put, I put V equal to C mm -hmm. and I get the Schwarzschild radius. Right. How many Hello. mistakes did I have to make to get the correct answer with the wrong theory. Um, yeah, I, I think it sounds like a coincidence. I I, I don't know. It, of course, um, if it's a calculation that would give you the right order of magnitude, um, right? It gives, so, it gives the right answer. No, no, I know it gives the right answer, but as far as I know, it's a coincidence that it gives the right answer. Um, I, I know it gives the right answer, uh, but. So, uh, I mean, of course, you can see what the calculation is, and you. you um, yeah, I mean, there are some there are some cases where, uh, by doing this more classical analysis, you don't get the the right answer. So the the problem of the deflection from the sun is an example. So if you take a 
a particle that moves, a massive particle that moves at velocity c, right? And you use the formula of Newtonian gravity um, for the deflection angle. You get an angle which differs by a factor of two from the correct angle. And in fact, Einstein had, had made this prediction from his uh, this thought experiment that we just uh, were discussing. And there was even someone who tried to uh, check the prediction, but couldn't because he was uh, caught as a first world war broke out and he was caught as a prisoner. There's a whole interesting story. But uh, he actually, if, if he had actually computed the angle, he had made the observation, he would have found an, an angle which was twice a factor of two different from the one that Einstein predicted. So I, I think it's uh, just a coincidence. I, I don't, <laughs> yeah. Okay, John. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, what uh, Juan, what you kind of implied and what I understand in terms of phrasing uh, it has to do with black hole complementarity that, you know, Susskind, at least that's where I've read, uh, had proposed and others. Um, I'm just wondering about the information paradox and whether on the horizon, you know, since everything slows down, you end up, as Susskind says, with strings. And then if you have Hawking radiation, you know, is, is it reversible that you can get back the information or do you need something like quantum entanglement uh, to yeah. do that? Yeah, so the, the, the current descriptions that we have are, are, well, if you really want to get the information, you have to pass through, you have to use this duality to, that we call holography. And in this duality, you just remove the whole space time and the black hole by this description of part in terms of particles at the boundary. Um, mm -hmm. So you use sort of a different language. Now, in, in more recent years, on the, in the third lecture, I would discuss uh, some recent progress that was made in computing certain quantities purely from the ball point of view without uh, using any of the dual any string theory, any duality, just purely from the laws of gravity, we'll be able to compute the entropy, but only the entropy. If you, um, of Hawking radiation, if you want to compute something more specific, such as uh, the state of uh, fields or the state of particles that comes out of a black hole, the, the detailed microstate, we don't know how to do it using the bulk variables, using the either by gravity or even using the string theory bulk variables that live in the interior, that live in the interior of space time. But uh, it's one of the goals, uh, one of the goals of this research is to understand how to do that. And as I said, there was some progress in understanding how to compute one quantity, which is the entropy. Okay, thanks. I look forward to your lectures. Okay, I think the next person was uh, Nick Nicodem. Nicodem. Thank you. Uh, professor, I have a question. Uh, so there are some theories uh, which avoid uh, singularity. For example, Einstein-Cartan gravity, sp space-time torsion uh, can act like gravitational repulsion. So instead of singularity, there is some maximum, maximum curvature. Uh, and in loop quantum gravity, for example, there is also some prediction that there is a maximum density. So as a result of one of those theories, uh, inside a black hole, singularity does not form and black hole uh, creates a new baby universe on the other side of event horizon. My question is, uh, would holographic principle on the boundary of such a wormhole uh, describe the universe on the other side? Yeah, I, I, I avoided talking about what happens at the singularity because we, we don't have, um, we don't understand the bulk theory well enough to say what happens. Of course, uh, just using classical relativity and the positive energy condition, um, the positive null energy condition, Penrose showed that there is always a singularity. Um, now, I view any of the theories that say what happens as very speculative and with very little mathematical background or backing. So uh, they are not more than guesses. So they, they're not well, mathematically well-defined theories. So. And of course, uh, one of the goals is to understand exactly, yeah, ha having 
good mathematical way of saying what happens, whether there is a second universe behind the singularity or, or exactly what happens. I mean, we, we, I think we don't really know. Okay, I think the last question is going to go to Frank Vandenbosch. Vandenbosch. Thanks. Thanks for a very clear talk. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, information loss paradox. Um, the, the notion is that, you know, no matter what kind of matter I dump onto the black hole, it comes out as Hawking radiation. I've just converted matter and radiation. I've lost all information. Can you explain to me the analogy? What, how is this different from when I have an electron and a positron and I annihilate? Does it constitute information loss? And if so, why or why not? Um, well, well, it, it's different in the sense that um, there is some state of the electron and positron before they fall in, right? So for example, the electron and positrons could be, let's say in the S wave of the analog of the hydrogen atom or in the P wave or whatever. Uh, and then uh, when they decay into photons, that information uh, is transmitted to the photons, right? Of, of which which particular uh, state they were starting from. So, and but, but the more we have, have it, two, if I have two different particles, electron positron, without yeah. knowing, without forget the phase space information, yeah. just to forget two different particles and annihilate them into you know two identical particles, doesn't that in constitute an information loss? Um, no, no, there isn't. No, in principle, no. Um, I mean, because also the, the two photons can also go into, well, the point is the, the point is the following, that there is a, a Hamiltonian or a unitary operation, right, mm -hmm. that uh, transforms the electron and positron into the two photons and could also do the same backwards, right? So we, we understand this uh, process as the result of uh, unitary evolution in a quantum theory, in the quantum field theory. So, so we have an explicit description where we, we understand uh, how, how to do it. Of course, if we didn't know quantum electrodynamics, uh, we, well, we, we wouldn't know whether it is uh, unity or not, and maybe it might be experimentally difficult to figure it out. But um, having the description of quantum electrodynamics is explicitly unitary, and its predictions agree with predictions of experiments. Uh, so we think that that's a unitary process. Okay, I think given the time, we should uh, break. So let's again thank Juan for a beautiful talk, the best way we can for Zoom. And I look forward to seeing all of you uh, next week for the second lecture. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks. See, See you. you. Thanks. Take care.